All right. Welcome back to the Phil Bach Podcast. How great is this? I get to talk to Mike Green and you get to listen. Better for me, but still good for you. Um, Mike is the chief strategist at Simplify Asset Management. Simplify has an exceptional team, sophisticated funds that are using options to bring enhanced portfolio solutions. It's one of the fastest growing ETF issuers out there. Mike has been a portfolio manager at a number of hedge funds, and he is one of the most prolific writers and researchers going deep into market structure. Mike, thanks for joining the podcast. How are you doing? Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, Phil. Thanks for having me. Well, thanks for coming on. This is actually the second time we did a uh, an impromptu debate on market structure a couple of years ago with Eric Balchunas, which was also a great episode. I felt bad for Eric. It kind of there was a, a Twitter debate, and I was like, "Hey, why don't we just jump on and record this?" And uh, it ended up being a bit of a pile on because I think you and I are, are very like minded on some of the market structure issues, and poor poor Eric was left to defend uh, the indexing side of it. Um, it was a little bit unfair to him, but it's great to have you on. Well, it's it's nice to be here. If I remember correctly, actually, you guys were having a conversation, and I was incredibly rude and popped on to defend myself in some way, shape, or form. If I remember the conversation, um, but uh, it, yeah, it was it, it definitely was a little pile. And I think one of the interesting things is how much that conversation has actually shifted in the public eye. You know, if we look back then, it was a debate around is there any impact from passive. Now we're very much in a scenario in which people are debating how important is the impact of passive and is it ultimately something that we need to address immediately or is it something we can put off to the next day? Well, that's so it's been a real it's been a real shift. It it, it I mean just it, it's played out exactly as um, as we uh, or as you warned and and were concerned and and you see certain things like like yeah the you know the the passive flows and we'll get into the mechanics of it but the passive flows. You know, increase the 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 rich get richer in the market, and the the highest um, the highest percentage allocations within passive get bigger and bigger. But then, you know, the other part of it is you talk about the um, the lack of friction due to price setters, and you see what happens with Nvidia. You see what happens with meme stocks and and other um, you know other stocks that don't have any friction and just and completely go in. And what, what what's amazing here is as the thesis plays out and and is proven. The complacency of investors just continues also to extrapolate itself and, and to become, you know, investors become more and more complacent. Number goes up. Nobody cares. Nobody gives a shit. Everything is fine. Conventional wisdom is to buy passive funds. Um, so le let's let's set the table here um, and let's kind of just start from the beginning. So and, and I don't want to, you know just go over, you know, well trod ground already, you know, over and over, but, you know, just to kind of, for, for listeners that aren't aware of your thesis and some of these market structure issues that have been talked about. Um, in fact, you know what? I'm sorry, Mike, let's pause it here. Let, let's do this. Okay. Cause yeah. <laughs> the better way to set it up is, is as follows. Okay. Yeah. The audience will bear with me. I'm uh, a little rusty. This, uh, this, this podcast has been kind of stop and start, but I'm trying to keep my podcast muscles from atrophying. Um, and uh, w what I want to do here is David Einhorn was recently on Barry Ritholtz's podcast yep. and he talked about you. He gave you credit for really, you know, kind of turning on the light and, and you know, showing him some of these market structure issues, how, how the light bulb went off. What was the conversation that you had? What did you say to David Einhorn, who himself is one of the most brilliant and expert people in the market, to make him see some of these issues? Well, you know, so it's fascinating. If you were to actually turn around and present it that way to David Einhorn, he would immediately downplay his brilliance, but I actually think, you know, one of the most humble, you know, individuals that I actually know, um, and incredibly, incredibly thoughtful. I think what was so interesting about it was that I think David was actually just, you know, part part of what I would, would say about David's brilliance is actually the fact that he is willing to take in that information, right? So I shared the same presentation with many other investors most of whom came back and said, I can't argue with your math, right? I can't argue with your analysis. I just kind of have to hope it's not true, right? Guys like Leon Cooperman and others were very resistant to this idea that the market had changed in any meaningful way. David immediately saw something true there. And when confronted with the truth, he changed his process. He suddenly said, look, the way I've historically approached this market is that I work harder. I identify ideas first. And I raise awareness of them and other people see the logic in my thought process and they are swayed to my point of view, bidding up the shares of something that I think is deeply undervalued. What he recognized was that those individuals that used to follow him into his positions, providing the exit liquidity and the increase in valuation, 
were actually no longer players in the game because they were being consistently and constantly redeemed, right? They were running out of capital on a continuous basis. And recognizing that, he simply said, look, I have to raise the bar in terms of my investment criteria such that I'm no longer looking for other market participants to deliver those returns to me. I have to change my strategy so that the company can deliver that return to me, either through share buybacks or through dividend payments or through growth that happens to be against a valuation that is so low that I actually can't see a scenario in which I lose money, right? It's very much more like the traditional Graham and Dodd type framework or the you know Benjamin Graham margin of safety type analysis in which he basically started saying, look, I wanna find something that I really can't lose on because he wasn't gonna get the assist from the market participants. And I just thought that was fascinating how he chose to interpret that, right? Now, I came at it from more of a macro investor standpoint and said, look, the implications are, as you alluded to before, the largest companies are going to become larger. This is a not a valuation-driven market. In fact, valuation is almost going to work in reverse. And there are very brief periods where that has been untrue. But for the most part, I think that's a pretty fair articulation of the market as it's behaved over the last seven or eight years. Um, and where it's untrue, by the way, there's really interesting insights that emerge around that, right? It's basically in the re-risk on periods after active managers have de-risked their portfolios that we suddenly start to see this move in small caps or value as they try to put that money back on into an inelastic market. So we have all sorts of interesting phenomena that I think, you know, I would agree with your characterization for the most part have confirmed my underlying thesis that the markets are actually structurally changed. And in many ways, I would argue, fundamentally broken by the growth of passive strategies. So it presents what Einhorn presented on, you know, in, in monetizing his value investments through cash flow of the company itself, it presents a third and a very interesting way to play this market. So to say, okay, let's say we say that, you know, passive flows have broken, have broken the markets. There are no price setters. There's no, you know, there's no exit liquidity cut. You're, you, if, if you have edge, if you are able to understand a company, understand the balance sheet, you see something in the balance sheet that nobody else sees. And you know that there's a real discrepancy in how they're reporting their numbers or how the market interprets their numbers or whatever it is. There is no mechanism to turn that edge, that insight into a company. There's no mechanism to turn that into a profit because the idea was always, well, you, you try to understand the company better than everyone else. You try to understand what's it, what its intrinsic value and its growth prospects and whatever, on and on and on. I know this company really well. I have edge in that. And eventually the market will come to see what I already know. And by the by, by the market coming to see it, okay, so then people will come in and, and, and bid the asset back up or down to where I'm betting it'll go. And that's how I make money. But now it's just, you know, it's greater fool. It's all just the greater fool theory. Someone else is going to come in and buy it. You can bet against it. You can say, I recognize these structural flaws in the market, and eventually it's the house of cards is going to collapse, and I'm going to bet against it. And I think anybody that's been doing that, you know, the market can stay irrational. Who knows how much longer than we can stay solvent, right? Anybody who's been doing that is probably, um, you know, wiped out already, if not on their way. So Einhorn presenting a third option. Hey, you don't have to play the long side here. You don't have to play the greater fool game. You don't have to bet against it, but you can still find undervalued assets and then monetize it through cash flow. I thought it was very, very interesting. I, I thought it was fantastic as well. And I actually would emphasize that that strategy can work, but that is different and distinct from what I would describe as systematic value, right? And so what David is doing is truly, as I said, a throwback to the old Graham and Dodd style of investing in which you're actually turning around and saying, can I generate the liquidity inside the company as compared to relying on outside parties to invest, right? The theories around efficient markets, this whole idea that markets reflect the available information are driven by David's initial model, right? Which is he identifies something, he begins to put money towards it, that in turn raises awareness of the information that David has obtained or the viewpoint that David has obtained. And others begin to recognize this, change their assessment of the company, bid up the shares in the process. And that creates the historical model that worked really well for David. I would actually say David's initial success in his career managing through the dot-com cycle, successfully shorting stuff at the same time that his longs managed to take him through the 2002 you know, 2001, 2002 type environment 
that really made him somewhat unique amongst hedge funds alongside maybe Dan Loeb as really performing by focusing on the same type of really small companies in the late 1990s. As he grew assets, that became harder, right? It just becomes harder to do that. You have to start playing with larger names. You have to identify, as he famously did, Apple or Microsoft as very cheap companies in 2013. Uh, you know, one of the great ironies is, is that value has actually not really done terribly, right? The return to value strategies overall has been roughly in line with historical. The systematic value factor where you are long the cheap stocks and short the expensive stocks has what's really underperformed. It's that short of the expensive stocks that has just carried people out. And that's long before the dynamics are around Melvin Capital or others, right? Um, you know, if you actually look at what was transpiring, we were seeing the hedge fund industry move from a long short, where it was effectively market neutral, to today the hedge fund industry is like 85% long, basically, right? It's been long a survival. And long mag. Fang, long mag seven, they're long all the expensive stuff for these reasons. They have to be. And in some ways, they actually have an advantage over traditional 40 act funds, right? So if you're a hedge fund, you could theoretically say, man, I've got real conviction and insight in NVIDIA, and I'm going to make it 10 to 20% of my portfolio because I don't actually have to match a benchmark. I don't have to consider the issue of tracking error, and I don't have individual investors who I run a risk if I market a non-diversified fund to them, right? So they're able to educate their customers. But the simple reality is, is that most hedge fund managers, exactly as you described, are trying to find edge on the information side of the equation. Right. They're trying to say, I understand this small company better than anyone else. I want to be in that old David model. Right. And that's simply not working. And it can't really work as long as the passive bid exists out there. The reason why this plays out, right, is because the reason why we traditionally think about markets as being largely informationally efficient and largely a wisdom of the crowds type phenomenon is because of a you know, and this is the sort of stuff that you encounter all the time if you pay attention to my work, like it matters what the assumptions are. And so the underlying thesis why um, markets remain efficient, even in the presence of passive parasitism, is largely tied to what's called the Grossman-Stiglitz paradox, which is the more inefficient or the more markets get pulled away from their fundamentals, the higher the incentive is for somebody to actually bet against that positioning. Right. Because theoretically, it's going to get pulled back to it for that model to be true. Right. Written by Sandy Grossman and Joseph Stiglitz. in I think roughly 1981, by the way, Sandy Grossman was my options professor at Wharton. Um, one of the guys I got into massive arguments around the dynamics of how to price options, even back when I was an undergraduate. But the, the, the simple analysis of that model is that it requires the same dynamic as the wisdom of the crowds. It requires basically everybody to get close to one vote, right? So you're familiar with going to the county fair. There's a giant you know, uh, jar of jelly beans. And if you guess the right number of jelly beans, you're the winner. You get to take home not only the giant jelly bar, jelly bar you know, uh, jar of jelly beans, but you also get to probably take home $1,000 or something, right? And you pay a dollar for the privilege of making this guess. The reason that works is that there's hyper nerds like me or David who are gonna sit there and calculate the diameter of the, of, of the jar and the size of a jelly bean. And we're gonna to try to mathematically figure it out. And we're probably gonna get pretty close to the right answer. And then there's some guy who's drunk with his girlfriend is going to show up. It's like, there's a million jelly beans in there. And then there's, you know, a, a blind granny who shows up and says, there's no jelly beans in there. I don't see any jelly beans at all, right? And the combination of those creates something that looks like a normal distribution. And that mean tends to be centered right around the right price, right? Or the right number of jelly beans, right? You're taking that wisdom of the crowds. The easiest way to break the wisdom of the crowds model is to give one player a thousand votes. Right. And effectively, that's what we've done with passive. We've introduced a single player that is so much larger than everybody else. Right. Remember, passive strategies are now somewhere north of 40 percent of all assets, and they're all investing under the exact same rubric. What's the market capitalization of the stock? Right. That's all they care about. They don't care about what the fundamentals are. They don't care about the direction. They don't care about the momentum components, et cetera, theoretically at least, but by focusing on market cap, they're turning that one player into effectively a momentum player. 
And that player just gets more and more and more votes under the current framework. Eventually, it will break, right? You can't actually win the game, even as the thousand, uh, you know, jelly bean uh, vote player, if you're that far away from fundamentals. It will eventually break, right? We will eventually say, okay, how many jelly beans are there actually? And then you find out that everybody's lost, right? Um, but that's the way the game is currently being played. Yeah, and, and I'll give you another framework, you know, besides the wisdom of crowds, which is the winner's curse. And the winner's curse is in an open auction, right? So we're all now bidding on this jar of jelly beans. Whoever bids the highest number is wrong. So it's the same as the wisdom of crowds. You say, okay, the average estimate is probably the most accurate, the average of all the participants. In the wisdom of crowds, it's not the average that wins. In any open auction, it's the highest bid that wins. So whoever is the biggest outlier in one direction to the upside, congrats, like we're all bidding on a house, right? You think the house is worth 800K, I think it's worth 700K, someone else thinks it's worth 1.1 million, congratulations, right? You're the furthest from the mean and the upside, you win, you bought the house, but congratulations, you also paid the highest price. That's the winner's curse. And in markets where there is no longer like a two-sided market where it's all just, it just keeps going until the winner's curse. And you see this and there's like a thin veneer of liquidity below, you know, on top of these markets. And that thin veneer, you know, it's like whoever is willing to pay every, because everything is marked to the last price that trades. And we see this in, in crypto and some of the other assets, everything gets marked to that last price, to that last sale. So the winner's curse, whoever sets it the highest, Everyone marks there. So I, I, I think that's right, but I would go even a step further and highlight that it's not actually a winner's curse if it's consistently reinforced by the next transaction, right? So you just paid 1.1 million for the house. Now the next dollar comes into a passive fund. It has to buy a house. It doesn't have the option of saying, you know what, we're gonna wait for prices to come back down. I think that last price was silly. Right, so thanks for the dollars. I'm gonna hold those in reserves and we're gonna use those to buy the next thing. No, it has to buy a house immediately, right? It's a little bit like what we're seeing in the very low supply of existing homes available for sale. A reasonable one shows up and it gets snapped up instantaneously because there's such a large mismatch between the number of people who desperately want a house and the number of homes that are available. If we raised inventory levels or sales of existing homes to historical averages, we'd almost certainly find that we swamp the existing demand and prices would fall, but that's not where we are right now. And it's the same underlying characteristic that you're seeing in markets as passive gets larger and larger and larger. Remember that net share gain means that there's fewer and fewer shares available for discretionary managers to sell, right? It's very similar to the housing dynamic that you, I think that's a good model that you introduced. You know, it is one of these perverse dynamics where eventually we're gonna to have to look at the number of jelly beans. And you can think about that jelly beans is basically what's the actual revenue that we're buying? What's the actual earnings that we're buying? What's the actual cash flow or dividends that we're buying? And the simple reality is we're paying a higher and higher and higher price for those long-term cash flows in this framework. Um, I've seen you be attacked for, for raising these issues. Um, you know, the, the big response is, is typically, oh yeah, well look at performance and, and that, you know, obviously the, the thesis, you know, says that the performance will continue and the performance continues. And then people point to that and they say, well, there's no, there's no problem. I mean, you know, investing is a single player game. None of us want the whole thing to, to collapse. But at the end of the day, if I'm, you know, managing my own portfolio, that's my primary concern is my own portfolio. What, what is your appeal to the market, to asset managers? Like what, you know, let's say that, that you're in a presentation like this and he says, yeah, you're right. You know, this is, we're really on a, on a collision course here. What, what is your appeal on like a one-to-one -one level when you're talking to investors about this stuff? Well, so, so unfortunately, part of the argument is exactly what you just said, right? This is the Chuck Prince, when the music's playing, you still got to dance type framework, right? Um, and the simple reality is, is that I, I can't turn around and tell people, no, you shouldn't own the S&P. You shouldn't own the total market. You shouldn't leverage yourself to these types of exposures as long as these characteristics remain true, Right. I can try to position my portfolios to take advantage of a contrarian action. And candidly, I've done some of that probably prematurely. Some of my portfolios are doing great. Some are, are doing less well because of those choices. But the simple reality is, is that most people don't have that luxury, right? Most managers don't have that luxury. And candidly, I'm not sure how, how long I have to have that luxury of being wrong in this type of market. And so you're forced, just like Chuck Prince was in 2006, 
to say if the music's playing, you got to dance. And so people are forced into long positions to keep up. Otherwise, they're just going to get fired. And that's understandable. That's part of the process, right? But it creates a self-reinforcing mechanism. You're too conservative. You get fired. You get replaced by somebody who is less conservative, likely somebody who's even more aggressive than the market, right? We could call that person Kathy Wood, for example, right? So you, you have this type of dynamic that is now built structurally into the market that encourages people to, unknown to them, you know, unbeknownst to them, seek greater and greater levels of risk. Yeah. Even, even as they think they're doing the most conservative thing in the world, I'm just going to buy the total market. And, and guess who survived? Guess who's in the market now, right? Anybody who, you know, I mean, look, I, I went out on my own in 2016, right, with, with you know, at the time, the strategies, that, you know, at the end of the day, if you run different strategies, but basically there were, there were value or quality strategies at their core with the idea that, right, well, you know, I missed this, you know, this big growth cycle, like let's play for the next cycle. And here we are eight years later and I'm hanging by a thread and there's so many people that I know and, and that, you know, hedge fund, I mean, you mentioned hedge funds, you know, getting liquidated and, and closing out. And what you get, what you end up with is a market where the the winners, the survivors, the people who are still, you know, allocating capital that, that who have succeeded and flourished are those that are, um, you know, th that are willing to take the most amount of risk, that are willing to just blindly, you know, trust the, um, you know, if not cap weight, unprofitable tech, all these trends that these trends are just going to extrapolate forever on an indefinite time horizon. Um, and, and again, yet another thing that, that exacerbates the problem because then there is nobody taking the other side of the trade. There's nobody left to take the other side of the trade. Yeah. I mean, that's the underlying dynamics of liquidity provision, right? And so this is the source of John Bogle's observation that if everybody indexed, the markets would fail, right? Um, the simple math is, is that cash has to be held within the market by somebody, right? Cash facilitates the buying and selling of assets without having to sell to somebody else. If everybody's fully invested all the time, we can kind of trade back and forth, but there's really actually, ironically, no asset that allows me to do that, right? Because I go to sell my Microsoft to buy Kohl's department stores. Somebody has to have cash to buy that Microsoft first before I can turn around and buy the Kohl's, right? Um, that cash is being depleted in the market by the growth of passive. I've shared this in other presentations. If I look at the world's largest actively managed fund, it remains the Fidelity Contra Fund. It's about $100 billion in assets. It's currently carrying about $2.5 billion worth of cash. That cash creates optionality. It allows it to buy a stock without selling something. It allows it to meet a redemption without selling something. It allows somebody at Vanguard or elsewhere to exit if they need to because uh, Fidelity Contra can show up and buy without having to sell something, right? Unless somebody has cash, the markets actually can't function. When you think about surveys like um, the flow shows from Michael Hartnett that looks at things like the level of cash and responses in surveys, we pay attention to that because we recognize that high levels of cash means that there's lots of optionality to buy, less optionality to sell. The problem is those types of surveys don't capture the passive investors who simply don't respond to the surveys. It's like the low response rates coming back for the BLS. They don't really exist. And in contrast to that Fidelity Contra at 2.5% cash, if I look at the world's largest passive vehicle, right, the Vanguard Total Market Index, it's somewhere on $1.6 trillion, carrying about $80 million of cash. $80 million, not billion, $80 million of cash. There is no mechanism that allows that to obtain liquidity and candidly, we're just incredibly lucky that complexes like that have continued to see inflows of capital, which perversely provides a ton of liquidity to the market, that cash must be invested right away. And so while everyone's searching around for the liquidity from, is it coming from the Federal Reserve? Is it coming from the Treasury, et cetera? We're missing one of these key sources of liquidity, which is simply replacing managers that hold cash with managers that are actually illegal. It's against their fiduciary responsibility to hold cash. They have to put money to work. That's a key source of liquidity that I think very few people pay attention to. We've seen the uh, index funds absorb uh, a lot of the meme stock uh, liquidity, right? Yeah. We don't talk about this, but we've seen that. Um, if you consider Tesla meme stock, certainly uh, large cap has, but, but even AMC and GME were the top, uh, I think two of the top four weights at one point of the Russell 2 at the peak of the meme stock raise. 
We're seeing index inclusions be front run before they're added to the index. Is that the play? Is the play to just run things up here and, and dump it on on the cap weight crowd who, I mean, belligerently doesn't care. They they just, it's it's incredible that you know two basis points of expense ratio matter so much, but twenty basis points of drag because they you know got stuck buying meme stocks at, at the top. Oh, that's what the market priced it. Uh, you know, and and there's no. Um, well, if, if that were evidence in performance, I think we'd all agree that we would, wouldn't want to pay two basis points and give up, you know, save save by paying only two basis points and give up 20 basis points of drag. But the simple reality is there's no evidence that that's true, right? That's a hypothesis, and we are all pointing to the fact that they're buying things after they've gone up so much. Super micro is the obvious one that we're dealing with on a topical basis right now, where it's become by far the largest stock in the history of the Russell 2000 it's going to remain in the Russell 2000 until the June rebalancing, even as it's added to the S&P in about 10 days, right? So we're actually watching those who want to replicate the S&P be forced to stockpile super micro like toilet paper in March 2020, right? They're, ba they're basically forced to say, okay, get me some because I'm not sure how much I'm going to be able to get immediately afterwards. And that in turn may actually cause me to underperform and create drag because I don't have the name. Right? They don't care about the performance per se, they care about tracking error, right? And everybody knows that they're able to front run it. It is an absolutely a form of stock price manipulation, but it's completely fair and love and war to turn around and say, it's been publicly announced that this thing's going into the S&P. I have a hypothesis that when it goes into the S&P, it's going to go up. Therefore, I'm going to drive it higher. Oh, by the way, if I actually see, th see something that might go into the S&P, that might hit these criteria, by buying low delta call options, I increase the probability of that event occurring. By increasing the probability of that event occurring, I raise the price of the stock. That in turn drives my low delta options into higher delta options, forcing both market makers to buy and increasing my exposure. This is a win-win-win, right? From a pure market win sort of behavior, right? We've created rules that now encourage speculation as compared to actual analysis, fundamental analysis, right? The system is built around price response. And that's most dramatically exposed in things like Bitcoin, where it's like, look, number go up. That's all we care about, right? That's really what matters. And if number goes up high enough, then they'll be forced to recognize us. There was a brilliant podcast that just came out from Dimitri Kofinas, in which he was interviewing a young man who was highlighting the, the requirement that we increasingly turn to the old myths to explain the world that we inhabit, right? And I loved this podcast. I thought it was so profound and so powerful because what he's highlighting is we are now approaching that point where for the vast majority of individuals, the world that we inhabit is largely indistinguishable from magic, right? We pick up a phone in the morning, we look at it, and it's a magic box filled with calculations and information and communications that are largely designed to capture our attention. Right. It's a little bit like, you know, Gandalf the Grey is sitting by our bedside, not nearly as imposing or frightening. Right. But we pick it up and it holds all the secrets to the world in it. Right. Including, you know, pedophilic uh, pizza rings in the Virginia area and, you know, 4chan that we can dig into and insights on Putin and the latest meme stock craze that's going to make me very wealthy. Right. Which I can buy in a gamified format with a you know, exploding present that, and confetti that says, congratulations, you bought, right? That's the world of our forebears, right? That's the world in which, why does the sun rise in the east? Well, there's this handsome young god who drives a golden chariot and it goes across the sky, right? We've moved away from the world in which people understand what's going on and increasingly they accept the phenomenon without understanding the mechanisms. And passive plays perfectly into that. How did you save for retirement? Well, I put money in this box and it multiplied. Did you do something to the box? Did you poke it? Did you prod it? No, I just put money in. That's all I did. It was magic, right? That's where we are. Yeah. Incredible. And, and the, you know, the low fee narrative was also very powerful. Hey, Wall Street's overcharging you. They're stealing from you. Here's low fee. Low fee, you know, the, 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 the conflation, the, the two stories of low fee and market cap weighted indexing, right? you know, aren't necessarily the same story, but they've been conflated together. And that narrative has proven remarkably powerful, more powerful than the active narrative or any other narrative. 
Well, I, I, I actually think that there's something else that's going on here, right? Which is, as you pointed out, there's a degree of misrepresentation. So we actually don't have the counterfactual of how much is this costing me? And perversely, if you've created what's referred to in, in systems dynamics programming as a positive feedback loop, by buying in this style and pushing stock prices up, that shows my performance is being better than I otherwise would have expected. Therefore, I buy more and prices get pushed up, giving me better than expected returns. And this continues until it ultimately breaks, right? That type of system, what I've described as driving uphill with no brakes, there's no real mechanism for somebody to say, hey, be careful, right? This is not safe. Because you can literally just say, no, look, if I take my foot off the accelerator, I slow down, right? The fact that I have no brakes is somewhat irrelevant. Of course, I can pull over and stop. I'm heading uphill, right? All I have to do is take my foot off the accelerator. Well, what happens when you crest the hill? And that's the part that is just really, really hard. Because if you don't have an understanding of the underlying mechanism, then it seems like, well, what do you mean uphill? There is no uphill. I don't even see this hill you're talking about. Right, right. And and you think about liquidity. There's so much liquidity on the way up, right? But on the way oh, out, when, again, when it a, becomes this... a poor seller and, and you don't have the flows coming in, it, you know, it, can, it, can, it can exacerbate very quickly. It can exacerbate very quickly. And I do ultimately want to highlight that that's one of the things that, that is interesting in how broken it is in this environment, right? Traditionally, you would have seen people do things like add leverage to their portfolios by using margin. But because margin has become so expensive, right? If I go to a Schwab or a Fidelity, I believe the current levels are prime plus a lot, right? I think that's the technical term. Like I'm hearing numbers of 9, 10, 11, 15% to borrow on margin in retail accounts, right? If that's true, well, what's the other way that I can borrow? I can use call options, right? And so this is part of what we're seeing is an explosion in the growth of the utilization of call options, which are an embedded form of leverage, right? Yes, they're limited liability. The most I can lose is my premium. But that's the same thing as saying the most I can lose in buying Microsoft is the price of the stock, right? Equities themselves, because they're limited liability uh, securities, are options on the capital structure. It's just when you switch them to actual derivatives on those equities themselves, right? Now I'm introducing a degree of timing and a degree of leverage that makes it much easier for me to use, lose 100% on otherwise very, very safe investments. And so we're just seeing this over and over again. We're seeing the very predictable behavior, but a lot of the, mechan you know, a lot of the indicators that we would have historically used to suggest froth and um, exuberance, things like margin debt are being devalued in favor of things like increased option trading, which is just another way of doing it without having to put margin in my account. Right, right. All right, I got to ask about this. So, so my my favorite part of Liars Poker by by Michael Lewis, the book. They're playing a game of Liars Poker. You're betting on the serial numbers of a dollar bill. It's basically a game about bluffing, a little bit about probabilities. And the CEO, John Goodfriend, uh, says to John Merriweather in the story, he says, "One hand, one million dollars, no tears." Right, is a great famous line. Now, John Merriweather couldn't afford to make the bet for a million dollars, but he couldn't back out of the bet either. So his response was, "Why don't we make it ten million? And then, of course, you know, good friend the CEO says, "Oh, that's crazy," and walks away, which I, I thought was great. Okay, reminded me of the story because Peter McCormick on Twitter offers a bet. He's he, he's willing to bet five to one that Bitcoin, currently trading at sixty-seven thousand, is going to hit a hundred thousand by the end of the year. Um, five to one, he's willing to bet. Um, uh, 20 to 100K, you said, oh, let's make it 2 million to 10 million. And that uh, you settled on a bet of 100,000 to 500,000. Is this a real bet? Are you, you know, is someone um, holding on to the cash? What's, what's, what's the deal here? What's the story? Uh, so we do have the bet. Um, we do actually have somebody um, who is providing escrow for us. I can't announce the name yet, but we will ultimately announce it, it is a crypto oriented firm. So I'm happy that they're able to capitalize on the advertising associated with it. I think it's really easy to confuse the roles in this game, right? So actually I'm an outsider as you described it in the battle between Meriwether and Goodfriend, right? So Meriwether is a managing director. He's making a lot of money, but he doesn't have nearly as much money as John Goodfriend who has benefited dramatically from the going public of Solomon Brothers, probably worth somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 million bucks, right? 
So for John, uh, John Goodfriend, a million dollars is basically his marketing pitch to say, hey, I'm still relevant. I may not be on the trading floor, but I can still show you guys who's boss. And um, uh, Meriwether looks at that and does exactly the analysis that you said, which is, well, a million dollars is going to hurt me a lot. It's really not going to hurt him. It basically is a game of chance. I can't actually lock in any form of edge, even if I think that I can outplay him. And as a result, I'm going to raise the bet to the point that it's basically true counterparty risk for me and a large enough number that he faces real distress if it occurs, right? He's losing on an after-tax basis 25% of his wealth, roughly, right? That causes Goodfriend to for be forced to back down because he just can't take the terms of the bet at that point. And so he'd rather walk away, okay? In this situation, Peter McCormick, plays the role of John Goodfriend and tries to bully another Twitter participant who said, I don't think it's at all possible. Bitcoin will never make $100,000. Now, I have actually no opinion on whether Bitcoin can make it to $100,000 or not. I have a very strong opinion that Bitcoin has been misrepresented to the public as a potential tool for a future uh, financial system. And I have a host of reasons why that's the case. I'm more than happy to walk people through it. And by and large, I look at the Bitcoin community as a bunch of people like Peter who are engaged in overly aggressive and, in my opinion, abusive marketing techniques. I can now add BlackRock to that mix, by the way. So when, when you actually see what happened here, I happen to be observing a bet between John Merriweather and John Goodfriend and recognize that the ridiculous odds that John Goodfriend offered to John Merriweather in an attempt to bully him, are so wrong in their construction that I'd rather just step in and bankroll the bet myself and, and, and step in, right? Basically proving two points. One, Peter McCormick sucks at math, right? And two, while he thinks he was marketing Bitcoin, what he actually was marketing was his bullying techniques. And so calling him on it, and, and by the way, this has been further validated by his behavior afterwards, right? He's called me every name in the book, including, you know, trying to, you know, shame me by saying, you know, Mike Green is a dork, right? I'm a 53-year-old man who's raised three kids, right? You think I'm getting called a dork by Peter McCormick matters to me? <laughs> Dude, I was called a yeah, dork six times before breakfast by my kids, right? Um, so, like, it's just funny. It's this childish dynamic where you're like, I'm just watching bullies on the playground. And so I step in and I take their lunch money as compared to them being able to go and be like, oh, they're scared of me, blah, 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 right? That's literally all that happened. He gave such unattractive odds or such attractive odds that I don't care. I actually make more money if Bitcoin goes up than I do if it goes down, right? It was just a terrible bet. And in my opinion, it's much more about exposing the it's just math crowd doesn't know how to do math. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. Um, tell us a little bit about your uh, credit spreads theory and uh, CDX ETF. Sure. So look, the underlying thesis that I'm applying to the credit market is credit risk is traditionally thought of in the context of spreads, right? So the difference between the risk-free rate and the credit rate, that's traditionally what is signaled potential risk in both credit markets for corporates and for households. We've really never had a condition under which interest rates have been hiked so rapidly, right? And we're seeing this in metrics, like if I look at personal interest expense, excluding mortgages, which are largely locked in, and the quantity of mortgages really haven't changed very much. So the interest rate is not changing on mortgages, but it is on everything else. We're seeing that personal interest expense rise at the fastest rates in history. And particularly if we apply that to things like the median household income, we're now at levels that it's candidly just unsustainable, right? You can meet an unexpected increase of 3% in your household expenses in your first year of that occurring by drawing down savings. You can't do that in the second year. Right. And so now we're actually approaching these breaking points. We see this in corporations that are incapable of refinancing, not because credit spreads are wide, but because the risk free rate is so high. They're watching their interest rate expense explode. They simply can't afford to do it. We see this in the lack of issuance in the high yield space, even though we're seeing an extra, you know, it's perceived to be an extraordinary loose financial conditions environment. The only other times we've seen things like this play out have been the lead into the global financial crisis, et cetera. The, the risk indicators, I would argue, are largely broken. 
And as a result, we're being given an opportunity to buy hedges on high yield or other credit at very attractive prices. We've done that within our high yield with credit protection product. Um, and that actually has been a fantastic performer, even as credit spreads have not widened as much as we would have anticipated. If they widen further from this point, my expectation is that that product will not only allow us to capture the higher yields, but also benefit from the widening of credit spreads. It's currently slightly overhedged in this framework. But again, the only other times we've seen stuff like this have been lead-ins to major credit events as we suddenly discover that people are incapable of servicing this debt. Yeah, and and you know, I, I don't know if we have time. I mean, I've got enough questions here. We could probably go for for eight or ten hours here. I mean, this is, but you know, everyone had been talking about zombie companies, and if rates ever rise, how are these zombie companies where the debt service is higher than earnings? How are they ever going to refinance and survive? And that there would be a coming wave of of defaults. We haven't seen it yet, but it, you know, it just seems like that whole conversation has kind of disappeared. Um, well, I, I, I think it's disappeared because there's two components to it. First of all, recognize like when we talk about you know, all these zombie companies and that they were going, there's going to be a credit event. We're watching banks fail again. <laughs> I mean, like, it's not like this is not actually playing through. We're seeing an increase. There's been another uptick in bankruptcies once we've entered 2024. We're moving right back up to the elevated levels that we had in parts of 2023. So, you know, we're looking at conditions in which I actually think the events are occurring. We just are somewhat blind to it for a variety of reasons, right? Um, you know, that that doesn't mean it's not going to occur. That doesn't mean it is going to occur, but it is actually an empirical statement that we're seeing an increase in bankruptcies. We're seeing an increase in delinquencies. We're seeing an increase in severity of write-offs. We're seeing CRE slowly start to fall apart as the, you know, uh, back to office moment has passed and we really are not seeing it play out. Right, the retail space, the commercial real real estate space that is dominated by retail and the tenant locations within offices. Walk through New York City, count the number of empty storefronts. It's a disaster, right? And so we actually know this. And the irony is, is because of other features that are built into the market, in particular the lagging nature of things like owner's equivalent rent, our policymakers are largely trapped in an environment in which they think inflation has remained persistent, even as current metrics, things that exclude things like owner's equivalent rent, and actually I think are quite powerful products, things like Trueflation or the Cleveland Fed's new tenant rent index. These are all indicating significant deflationary conditions directly ahead of us. Picker is CDX. Mike is also the portfolio manager on FAG, FIG, FIG, the uh, the macro fund. Um, tons of amazing products, very cool products. It's Simplify that US is a Simplify website. Uh, it is Simplify Asset Management. So it's uh, www.simplify.us is the website. And yes, I would encourage people to check out both the products and the content. We try to spend a lot of time educating people. Simplify is an ETF firm that was launched in September of 2020 in response to regulatory changes that allowed the inclusion of traditional hedge fund-like strategies in ETFs. And so we offer a number of strategies that I would argue are uncorrelated to traditional risk assets. Part of our objective is to raise awareness for people that these can be obtained without dealing all the tax hassles, filing reporting and uh, filing requirements, et cetera, associated with the traditional hedge fund industry. And liquidity, right? You can get your money out. You don't have to sit there and wait uh, sometimes months. The the hedge fund structure is- uh, well, ho Hopefully that's not what your objective is, but I think far more powerful. <laughs> I'll tell people, tell people candidly, if you've ever been an investor in hedge funds, there's this wonderful thing called a K-1 that tends to show up late, right? Complicates your taxes and probably means that you're not actually receiving particularly good value. Um, we've largely dispensed with that. You're not going to see K-1s, et cetera. And I think Honestly, like people have asked me, why did you transition over to the ETF space? The answer is really straightforward. It solves problems for the majority of investors that want to pursue these types of strategies. And I'm seeing more and more hedge funds start to explore doing the same. Doing the same. Fortunately, I feel like we've gotten the first mover advantage. I hope we continue to capitalize it, capitalize on it. Yep. Uh, um, Professor Plum on Twitter. Yes, I give a fig on Substack, which is hysterical. Uh, reference to the fig ETF. Um, thanks, Mike, man. Thanks for coming on. I, I, I don't know, man. This is, you know, it's, it's a little scary, but I think, um, you know, 
uncertainty and, and, and volatility and whatever might be coming, it all creates opportunity and opportunity for people to get out in front of it and hedge themselves and be in the right products that are going to, you know, that are going to survive in, in any market environment, not just the one that we've had since the global financial crisis, but the one that may be coming. I hope you're right. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Thank you for listening to the Phil Bach Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please take a moment to drop a review. This show was published for entertainment purposes only and is not investment advice. Please contact a licensed professional before making any investments. Some of the securities discussed on the show may be owned by its participants. Opinions expressed on the show may not reflect those of their employers. Stay hungry and stay foolish.